Welcome to this edition of Time to Face the Facts. I'm Jerry George. Across the region, many opposition parties are not taken seriously. Is this a casualty of the first past the post system where the winner takes it all? Or is it that the opposition parties have not made themselves viable? Let's find out on this edition of Time to Face the Facts. Welcome back to this edition of Time to Face the Facts. I'm Jerry George this evening, and we're looking at the issue of the opposition in the region. Are they fulfilling their obligation to you to represent you as a, an alternative to the government? Joining me first this evening is Mr. Kerry Simmons. He's the leader of, of opposition business in the House of Assembly here in Barbados. Kerry, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me, Jerry. As we start out this evening, uh, first of all, Let's put on the table exactly who is the opposition and how do we get an opposition in the House of Parliament? Well, I mean, that, that is fairly straightforward in Barbados. The, the opposition would be that body of persons who would not have been able to secure the majority in order to, to, to have, him, have won the election um, and therefore form the government. So we therefore form the opposition to the government in Parliament. Um, in Barbados, there is really a two-party system um, so that the Barbados Labour Party is right now in opposition, having only won 14 of the 30 seats and the government won 16. Now, you speak of the two-party system. Yeah. I propose that, is that system really, do you think, really working for us in the region at this point in time, do you think? Well, I think different countries are, are showing different um, trends. I would say that in Barbados it is working. Um, it is important to understand that the opposition doesn't just come and be part of the, the process. It has to, 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 to live up to certain expectations. The opposition, I think as you put it in your introduction very appropriately, has to make itself viable or appear to be viable and be an alternative government in the eyes of the people of the country. Um, it therefore means that the opposition has certain rights and responsibilities. Um, it is a two-way street. It is not just about your, 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 what you wish to achieve or what you see as being your rights, but you have some responsibilities which you have to discharge, and, and, and those obligations have to be seriously met. I think the public then satisfies itself that the opposition has, has discharged whatever burden it is expected to discharge, and that is, in some measure, how you form the government. Um, very often it is said that governments uh, are beaten rather than oppositions win um, <laughs> to the extent that that is a distinction. But the reality is that very often governments beat themselves by making mistakes. But the opposition has to be there um, almost like a, 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 a cricketer waiting at first slip in order to make the most of the opportunity. Now, when we look at the state of the region at the moment, mm -hmm. in just about every single one of the countries across the region, there is nothing about, um, we're just short of economic mayhem in some places. Um, there are social problems. Do you think that the opposition ought to take some of the responsibility for where we are, in the sense that the opposition has not presented sufficient, quote unquote, opposition to some of these, these policies? Well, I don't know that I am equipped to speak for every single part of the region, Jerry. Um, let's start with Barbados, where I feel most comfortable. The answer to that would be no. We are about five months outside of an election period, where, as I said, we, the opposition, won 14 of 16 seats. And in fact, there are perhaps 200 votes or less separate one party from the other in government, so that they, they, it was an extremely close election. Um, a lot of the issues that we put on the table during the campaign were dismissed by the government of the day. Um, the government in my judgment, ran a campaign which was more about propaganda and striking panic in the, in the hearts and minds of Barbadians. And five months later, they have come full circle and virtually have now admitted that all the things that we were saying were likely to happen are in fact happening. So you did not make a good enough case. You're admitting that to me. No, I'm not saying not, it, not at all. They you... come to admit it. Yeah. And the other thing I want to ask is why do you have to wait until an election? Why isn't the opposition much more forthcoming, much more aggressive? 
Oh, no, but I don't think there's any issue about the aggressiveness in Barbados. That's what I'm saying. In the Barbados case, I think, you, you, we, I think we would pass any test on the basis of aggression. What, what we did not succeed in doing was convincing an extra two or 300 people that we should be in government. Why not? And there may be a number of reasons for that. Share some of them. <laughs> Could you share some of them with us? No, I, I mean, look, you, you, you do your best to try to, to achieve success in the election. I don't think there's any political party or politician who goes in it to lose. So that having not been successful, um, you know, there could be a number of reasons for that. One of the main reasons I suspect in Barbados is simply that we traditionally have a pattern of giving a government two terms. Um, there, there is a, a feeling that there is only with the greatest possible reluctance will the Barbadian electorate remove a government without having given it what they call a fair chance. And historically, there's never been a government that has been defeated in Barbados in one term. That might be tradition, but mm -hmm. let's look at the reality now. The reality now is that we do have practically precarious economic situations. True. Okay? If the opposition says that they are the alternative, that they are viable to change that situation, why aren't they convinced? Tradition or not, why haven't they convinced the populace that, listen, things are bad, they are heading in the wrong direction, we can fix it? I believe if there was an election in Barbados today, um, Jerry, we would win it. That is the opposition party. The reality is that things went more steeply downhill between February 21st on the day of the election and today than they were going downhill, let us say, in the last six, seven months prior to the election. So it may have been difficult to, to, to bring to uh, the, the, the forefront of the public's mind the severity of the situation. And that, that happens in, in several countries. Um, what we have also to recognize, I think, is that one of the things that the oppositions have been doing, and this is now regional wide, I think has been trying to make sure that a level of pressure is maintained on the party that forms the government. And that, and that party, um, therefore, is almost compelled to walk a, 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 a narrow, straight and narrow path while it is in government. Now, I do not know that in every single instance you can blame the opposition for failing to, to, to meet that high standard. In Barbados, for example, we have done a number of things which are traditionally required of us by way of the um, Westminster parliamentary system. We raised parliamentary questions, many of which, I should tell you, died on the order paper of the last administration. That is, the questions are, are asked but never answered. And there's nothing that an opposition can do to compel the government ministers to answer. Um, you have private members' bills and resolutions, um, some of which may never be debated. Uh, as recently as last week, the leader of the opposition and myself became the target for the angst of the administration, largely because of the fact that we walked out on a matter of principle. And we felt strongly that we were not being treated in the, in the, in the correct way in the House of Assembly. And uh, that became, that act, and I, I quote the speaker, we had the gumption and, 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 and the act of walking out and, and comments made asso and associated with the walkout was then, um, uh, the consequence of that was that we were supposed to be carried to a committee of privileges to be disciplined. And, and our, our, our colleagues stood shoulder to shoulder and we defied the government and beat them on a vote to take us to the committee of privileges. So that there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, effort being made by the opposition. In Trinidad, um, I think one of the things we have to be careful about in the region, if you, if you go the route of whether parties in opposition are making themselves viable, is what we are seeing as a trend of targeting opposition main speakers or frontline persons. In Trinidad, you have Keith Rowley, who is the opposition leader, and um, <laughs> I, if we read correctly what is being said, you get the impression that there, there are efforts to bring every type of charge against him. And one wonders whether this is not now a question of suppressing the voice of the opposition. I am satisfied that in Barbados, the efforts made uh, last week, Tuesday in Parliament, would have been, if successful, an effort to suppress the voice of the opposition leader and myself. Um, and, and I think that is replicated in other parts of the region as well. We're coming up to a break shortly, but two mm -hmm. of the questions I'd like to ask, and maybe when we come back from the break, one of them is, are the current rules really working for us in the region in terms of, 
allowing the opposition to do its work. And secondly, are the resources of government, as you quite rightly said, being unfairly used against the opposition? Uh, we'll take that question on return from this break. Okay. You're looking at this edition of Time to Face the Facts, and we're looking at the role of the opposition. Are the opposition doing their work, the work that's expected of them? We'll take a break. We'll be right back in just a moment. Welcome back to this edition of Time to Face the Facts. And this evening, we are looking at the opposition, its role in the region, and we're asking the question, is the opposition of the region failing the people of the region in fulfilling its obligation to the region? Join us on set now is Mr. Sean Richards, and he's the leader of the opposition in St. Kitts Nevis, one of those places where there's quite a bit of turmoil. But we'll come back to you in just a moment. When we went to the break, I'd ask Mr. Simmons the question. Um, if he feels that the government is using its resources to unduly pressure the opposition. I would answer that question in the affirmative. I, I, when, when I say resources, let me be very clear. I think the superiority of numbers in the government um, allows them to, to, to attempt to treat the opposition as though we were more of an impediment to the process of governance rather than an essential and integral part of the process. Um, and in Barbados, we have had the creeping but unfortunate experience of seeing that time and time again. And it may be small things, Jerry, sometimes, but they are they Because are I was impactful. just going to ask you, what are yeah. some of those things that you think, and, and please put your mind to it, uh, Sean, as we come back to you. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, okay, for example, you, 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 you have the command of the House and the, the business of the House of Assembly. Now, that is supposed to be the people's business, but the government shapes and determines what, quote-unquote, is the business of the day on any given day that Parliament meets. And you may find, as we did very recently, that you come to Parliament one Tuesday morning and you're going to debate an issue of some significance. Um, in Barbados, it was an amendment to the Family Law Bill, a Family Law Legislation, Family Law Act. And that amendment, of course, can touch every single household in Barbados because you're talking about family law. It is of significant social import. But the reality is that we um, <laughs> were given notice of the bill less than 24 hours before it was debated. So that you, you find yourself in a situation where you are, I think, being boxed into a corner and treated as though your contribution is of necessity insignificant. Now, our position has been in the opposition in Barbados that we are not going to tolerate that. And so there is a pushback from us. And our members will do whatever is necessary, um, burn the midnight oil, in order to be prepared for every single bill that is on the order paper so that whatever government brings on any given day, we will debate. But there has to be a proper way of doing these things. And, and a period of decency with respect to notice is, is one of the issues that, that we insist should happen and we hope would happen. I had mentioned before the fact that you asked parliamentary questions. Now, this is an age-old process. The, the, the opposition um, asked questions of the government in England uh, across the Commonwealth. This is the way it is then, because you want to highlight certain issues and you want to give the government an opportunity to speak to the people, not only about what they choose to speak about, but things that we consider important as well. The, the indecency of it is that you, you ask the questions, the questions are tabled, but they're never answered. And, and that is an unfortunate When you part. say never answered, you mean they're just ignored? But some ignored? were never answered, some were ignored, that's right. As I, as I tell you, they died on the order paper in the last election. We went into election with questions that had been, been tabled and, and asked. I asked questions related not only to Barbados, but also to CARICOM. I remember well in the last administration, um, and they were never answered. No, shouldn't, shouldn't the opposition be bringing these facts to the people and saying to the people, we're trying to represent your cause, mm -hmm. but this is what is happening. Mm -hmm. Or do you think the people at this point... No, you, you, you bring those things to the people, but I mean, let us be frank. That in and of itself will not make people... It will make some people vote with you. Some people will be moved as a matter of principle. But that is not, I think, the deal maker or deal breaker in a national election. Their whole... No, no, it's not necessarily... Yeah. I'm talking about now the day-to-day everyday thing that gets you to an election. Yeah. Isn't it sometimes we leave these things, we let them slip, mm -hmm. and we then want to have a, a mountain built up during election time where we can then get some action when, in truth and in fact, 
we haven't been consistently bringing to the right. people these issues. Well, candidly, Jerry, I think that it goes beyond just the opposition on that. Mark, the opposition has done its duty when it has asked the questions, when it has highlighted certain issues. The opposition has discharged its duty when it pressures the government about not having answered. But I think mm -hmm. it is at that point that civil society in the form of the media and the form of other concerned entities must then let their voice be heard. Because you must remember that th this thing about being the watchdog over those people who hold public power uh, or power over the public is very important. It's not just a, a one party's interest or a one party game. It, it is the country as a whole must let its voice be heard. Coming back to the issue of what yeah. you think the role of the media is, um, how do you see in St. Kitts, for example, which by the way um, is certainly, I believe, a very, very interesting case at the moment in terms of how the opposition is being treated? As you pointed out, it is a very, very interesting case as to how the opposition is being treated, not just for St. Kitts and Nevis, but it stands out as a bad example for the rest of the Caribbean okay, region. Okay, for, for viewers who, don't, who are not aware of the current situation, give us the background of the St. Kitts situation. Okay. What we currently have taken place in St. Kitts is a government who is making every single effort to thwart the efforts of the opposition. On December 11th of last year, 2012, a motion of no confidence was filed with the clerk of the parliament in St. Kitts and Nevis. Up until today, that motion of no confidence hasn't been debated it hasn't even reached the other paper in St. Kitts and Nevis. In April, after realizing that the Speaker and the Prime Minister have absolutely no intention of having the motion being heard, the opposition decided to take the matter to the court, asking the court to declare that our constitutional rights are being violated because certainly the Constitution speaks to the fact that the opposition can bring a motion of no confidence against the government. When we took that matter to court, the speaker indicated very publicly uh, that the matter is now sub judice, and as a result of that, it cannot be heard by the parliament. We, of course, hold a totally different view. But from a legal perspective, is he correct? From a legal perspective, no. We don't agree with him. Is that what you agree? From a legal perspective, isn't it correct? It is not correct. We took the speaker to court to force him to do something uh, that he ought to be doing. Mm -hmm. Now, had he taken a decision to table the motion of no confidence in Parliament, we would have simply withdrawn our matter from the court because essentially we were in court because we want the motion to be debated. So it's as simple as that. So but isn't the court system sometimes a little bit um, slow in getting stuff done? Isn't that a risk you, take, you took? It is a risk that we took, yeah. and as a result of that, on the 3rd of July, we instructed our lawyers to withdraw the matter from the court. We have since written to the speaker, indicating to the speaker that the matter has been withdrawn from the court, and now he has absolutely no reason. Slow. Would you say the court has failed you? And I want you in on this. Isn't there some matter, if it's a constitutional issue, shouldn't this court give it priority in its hearings? There is that famous saying, a justice delayed is justice denied. I'm not just looking at the delayal aspect. I'm talking about a constitution. In my mind, in terms of law, a constitutional issue usually takes priority. Um, mm -hmm. I, I might I, be wrong. Well, I, I don't know if they, they filed it with a certificate of urgency attached to it. I, that I don't know. But I could understand the, the, that there would be some urgency um, uh, normally. But let me go back a little bit because I think that Sean is on a good point when he talks about the, 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 the government's treatment of the opposition. It is a convention of the Westminster system, and one of the things that we are tied by as opposition parties is the convention. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We haven't brought down everything into written rules. We just follow a tradition, a conventional uh, treatment of people through, for hundreds of years, as far back as the memory of man can run. And the, the fact is that when you have a no confidence motion, we've had several of them here in Barbados, they are usually treated with an, a level of urgency. So I understand their concern. When you have tabled a no confidence motion, 
It is one of those things, whether it is in a minister, whether it is in, a, in the government as a whole, it is one of those things that arrests the attention of the nation. And you say, look, all business should cease at this point because there is a critical issue that must be resolved. But this is the second time in very short succession that we have had this. It happened in the, with the former administration, Grenada. But at least in Grenada, they took a different position. The first motion they was treated with priority and debated. The second time around, the Prime Minister took a decision to prorogue the Parliament in Grenada. In St. Kitts, the Parliament has met since the vote of no confidence motion has been filed. As I was saying to you, we instructed our lawyers to withdraw this matter from the court. The Speaker then said to us that he is going to court to force us to keep the matter in court <laughs> after saying to us that he's not having it heard because it is in court. Because I'm, I'm saying to you, he recognizes the slow to the court system and he's used it in his favor. He is using it in his favor, but as Kerry just pointed out to you in the first instance, we should have never had to go to court to have this matter pursued. There is convention. When it comes to parliament, you have parliamentary procedure, you have rules, you have the constitution, you have statute, and you also have convention. And so, in regards to our parliamentary procedure, they say where there is silence, then that of the Westminster system of Britain, mm -hmm. we adopt those rules. And in this case, it hasn't been adopted. No. But well, where are your supporters? If you feel so strongly that you, at this point in time, have the confidence of sufficient members of the House to be able to take out the government, where are the supporters? And we do have enough members because only the elected members can vote on I such know a that, motion. But I'm saying where are the supporters to? To help you press that point? We have been pressing the point in regards to support from the general public in St. Kitts and Nevis. We have had several demonstrations. Civil society has written several letters to the Prime Minister and also to the Governor General indicating to him that this matter should be given priority. You have had letters being written by the Chamber of Industry and Commerce, the Evangelical Association, the Christian Council the Bar Association, the Hotel and Tourism Association, they have all written. We have also written letters as an opposition to all the heads of government and opposition leaders within CARICOM. And let me say here that I am firmly of the view that those leaders, they have failed not only the people of St. Kitts and Nevis, but the entire Caribbean. Who, the leaders of the opposition in the region or the leaders of government in the region? Both. Both. Kerry, you are under the microscope here. Come back to you. I'm, 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 I said I'm that. The opposition. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you need a business in the house, but go ahead. I said that because what is happening in St. Kitts and Nevis is a threat to democracy elsewhere in the region. What is to stop any other government or prime minister? from taking the same position in which the Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis has taken. What we have heard is basically nothing. You had Eustace Arnim quite recently, the opposition leader. Arnim Eustace. Arnim, Arnim Eustace, Eustace. The opposition leader in St. Vincent, who made a statement and said uh, that the leaders within the region have all remained quiet and this really and truly ought not to be the case because what is happening in St. Kitts and Nevis is a threat to democracy in question. the rest of May the region. Pointed. When Grenada had their problems, did you speak? When Grenada had their problems, are you referring to me personally? As leader of the opposition. When Grenada had their but problems, I probably was a leader. high school child at that point. <laughs> no, 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 no. Their problems with the, with, with the, the more recent ones. The, recent one but the more recent ones yes, in yes. terms of Tillman and yeah. what was happening there. At that point in time, I wasn't the leader of my party, to be honest with you. I became the leader in September mm. of last year. So I can't say that I personally would have said anything. Why I'm, why I'm asking that question, I'm being pointed to you, is, um, is the fact that in, that's the problem we have in the region. That, for example, we just had a heads of government meeting in Ju early July. And uh, in fact, let me phrase this a different way. Do you think that that should be a fitting occasion and the opposition should have an opportunity to present its case 
at the session like that. Can I, can I say something to you? That, that I, I, this, no, I'm, I'm glad that this conversation has happened because there's one thing I wanted to say tonight is this. I truly believe that in the same way that heads meet and discuss a range of things, yep. it is necessary for opposition parties yep. to hold, uh, well, parties in opposition to have an opportunity to caucus. And, and there must be areas across this region on which we have to give some sort of, of reflection and lend a voice. I think that one of the problems in CARICOM, quite frankly, is that we put on one side the question of, or the idea of having a, a parliament, which was a regional parliament, uh, where people from all around the region would have, ordinary MPs would have an opportunity to interface with each other need not be every month, it need not be... Um, one support yeah, is fine. Yeah, precisely, one support is fine. But the point is that things like this, that touch and concern the governance of member states, and the stability, quite frankly, of member states, are things that we should be here in the region. But the OECS about. has such, such a thing. What happened since? Because since this has been going on, I'm sure that the OECS parliament has been. The OECS has such a parliament. They meet in Antigua. During the last sitting, we made an attempt to get the matter ventilated before the OECS Parliament. However, the rules were used to indicate to us uh, that you have to give so many days notice and there must be general acceptance by the Speaker, etc. So it never made it to the discussion point at the OECS level. Gentlemen, hold on. What, what, what I'm hearing from, from you both here, mm -hmm. and, and a general feeling, is that really and truly, what we're calling democracy is not being solved in the region. Is that what you're trying to say to me? Yes, to some extent it is not being solved. St. Kitts and Nevis, we are the typical example of that. You have a prime minister who came to government by having the support of a majority of elected members of parliament. Now a majority of the elected members are saying, we no longer support you as a prime minister of St. Kitts and Nevis. If it is that you do not want to have the motion of no confidence debated, then the alternative is to call a general election some seven to months to eight months later. That hasn't been done. And so in terms of democracy and the maintenance of democracy, in St. Kitts and Nevis, we can't say that all is well. I mean, Kerry referred to a number of other different things before, and I can speak to similar instances in St. Kitts and Nevis. You go to Parliament and when you get to Parliament, resolutions are being put in front of you for the very first time. Last year we had a land for debt swap, whereby some 1,200 acres of land had been swapped with the National Bank in exchange for debt. When we got to Parliament, that is when we found out where the 1,200 acres are located. It so happens that 500 acres came from my constituency <laughs> and prior to going to parliament absolutely no information was given as a matter of fact there was no consultation with the public and when you speak about the patrimony of the people of St. Kitts and Nevis they more than anyone else he must have a decision to make they must be involved in whatever decision the government decides to take in regards to their land. When you're exchanging some 1,200 acres of land for $900 million worth of debt, in order for you to recover that $900 million, you have to sell the land for approximately $21 per square foot. The ordinary man in St. Kitts and Nevis cannot afford to buy land at that price. And so when you begin, you begin to look at the opposition, and from an economic and social standpoint, one can certainly understand uh, why the opposition would be concerned about this because there's serious economic and social implications when 1,200 acres of land basically may very well be sold to foreigners. Folks, um, should we have an opposition at all? Well, clearly you have to have one. I think it has to be respected. <laughs> well, this is I mean, from, I'm listening this, right, and I'm getting a sense across because I'm sure at some point in this, in this show we're going to be opening the phone lines. I'd like to hear what people have to say. But it, is, it seems to me that in many instances, um, the opposition is being ignored. That's, that's, what, that's the sense I'm getting. 
That is very true, and I think we need to look at, be it our constitution, our statutory laws, the rules pertaining to parliament, and we also have to be our brother's keeper in ensuring that we strengthen the laws, we strengthen the statutes, the constitution, whatever it is, to ensure that the opposition has a stronger and more meaningful voice. But you realize for a government to do that, they have to get two-thirds of the majority before which, they move in that direction. Which makes the opposition even more essential. Because if you have that dialogue with the opposition, then it is easier to achieve the two-thirds votes that one would need. Part of what traps us is the, the system that we function in. To be very honest with you, we are, we are sovereign states right across the region. And there is a, another convention which says, well, you don't want to get involved in the internal business of a sovereign state. We said that so, in so, <laughs> <laughs> so that you, the, the opposition it, party that... Is that just an excuse? But it, it, often it can be. The opposition party that speaks out and says, oh, no, this is we are in Barbados, but we're seeing it, and we don't like what we see, and so on. Um, you go into government today or tomorrow, and you then have to work in a meaningful and collaborative way with that same entity that you were speaking against. But so if you, if it's something that is wrong difficulty. and you speak out against it, why, why is there no, fear? No, no. I, 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 this is why I said to you, I think that the, the real solution better lies in a regional approach, right. which says, look, we have a regional movement. We, we, we can have a regional parliament. There are regional entities to whom Sean should be able to appeal. And, 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 and not just Sean's party, okay. but Okay, we, we need to go to a break, and we'll come back to that point. But I was also to also ask the question, um, when we come back from the break, is being given a mandate means you can do whatever you want as government. This is time to face the facts. We'll be right back in just a moment. Welcome back to this edition of Time to Face the Facts. We're looking at the role of the opposition and helping us to understand how it feels to be in opposition on some of the challenges are the opposition leader from St. Kitts Nevis, Mr. Sean Richards, and leader of opposition business in the Barbados uh, Parliament, Mr. Uh, Kerry Simmons. But I'd also like to let you know that the phone lines will be opened as of now. The numbers to call are one 213 7500. 1885213 Our local Barbados number is 1246 467 1046. That number again, 246 467 1046. I asked a question when we went to the break. When a government goes to election and it gets a mandate, does that mean that it has the right to do whatever it likes? No. No, it can't mean that. It, it, it is supposed to be governance by the rule, according to the rule of law. When I say what, whatever it likes, I mean in, in the sense of bringing the business to the parliament, in the sense of, of having wide ranging discussion and bringing in the people and everything. No, again, no, it doesn't mean that you can do whatever you like. And, and obviously there's a, what you would call a normative standard, what ought to happen. Um, there are some things clearly which are not necessarily illegal, but they leave a bad taste, if you will, in the mouth. And, and what we are hearing about in, in St. Kitts and in other places um, fit that description. They just ought not to happen. Um, it, it is important for the opposition to do what Sean is doing and what others are doing, which is to try to maintain the pressure, as I told you earlier. Part of our job has to be to make sure that we keep pressure on governments so as to, to ensure that they walk a straight and narrow path. Is that part of the problem? That the, the, the role of the opposition is seem to be, and the government seem to be, adversarial. But it is. It is adversarial. Yeah. But there are some people who, who tend to think that um, the role of the opposition is also to agree with the government. Well, you're going to agree on some things. I mean, I'm sure that there's some, some aspects of the United exactly. Nations if business that you're going to agree with. If it's in the best interest of the public, That's right. uh, then you would expect for there to be consensus, for there to be agreement. But if the public has concerns, you would expect the opposition to hear those particular concerns on behalf of their voters, on behalf of their constituents. The government 
of today can very well be the opposition of tomorrow. And I am certain that they would like to be treated with respect, with fairness. Which leads me to the question, when you guys get into government at some point, um, how, do you, how do you intend to treat this situation? Because that's sometimes in opposition you say one thing, and when you get to government, everything flips. Well, it has to be treated differently. I think it would be quite hypocritical for you to make certain pronouncements while you're in opposition, and yet when you get into government, you do the very same thing. My thing is that you have to move your country forward. You have to build upon what was there before, and you can only do that by putting the necessary laws, the necessary statutes in place to ensure that what would have happened in the past doesn't repeat itself and to ensure that there is general improvement in the lives of the people in the country and that democracy is maintained and further developed. Let's go to a constitutional issue. When you read the constitution, the constitution really says nothing about political parties. No, they, they, they don't exist in the constitution. You're right, they do not exist in the constitution. But in real life, they dominate because I know of a parliament where the manifesto of a political party was put on the table in the parliament. So what's, what, what signal are we sending? Is it that we have become too two party state much and is there's too much emphasis on the, the, the dominance of the party now? Perhaps, and that is an argument that we also have in sync it's at this point in time. What has happened is the prime minister fired one of his senior cabinet members Dr. Timothy Harris, his deputy prime minister, then took a decision to resign, and they are now working with the opposition to bring about a change of government in St. Kitts and Nevis. One of the reasons being advanced by the prime minister as to why the motion of no confidence shouldn't be debated is that these persons ought to resign because they ran on a Labour Party ticket and they need to get a new mandate from the people before any motion of no confidence is debated. Is that a constitutional position? Of course not. The constitution says nothing about that there is nothing in law which says that these two persons ought to resign. They of course have taken the position that we are not going to resign. We are there to serve the people who elected us to serve us. And what ought to happen is you need to call a general election since you're speaking about a mandate and let us see whether or not the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis still want you to be the government, still want you to be the Prime Minister. But his, his argument is legally sound. <laughs> it's impeccable. <laughs> that's, 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 that's my point. <laughs> but but, it, but right. it brings us back to the point of since the party seems to have been taken such a dominance in the life and in the politics and, and everything, and it is really not a creature of the Constitution, how could we reverse that? Because clearly we are headed down a path that, I just, one, is not sustainable, and two, is really not in the best interest of our democracy. Well, even, if, even when you, 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 you talk about the, because you're speaking really to what appears to be a creeping supremacy of parties. Creeping? But, but, <laughs> but, creeping. but the truth is that even then, you, I mean, in the St. Kitts analogy, the party itself the governing party has experienced a significant fracture. They've lost their, I think Timothy would have been the deputy, the deputy prime minister. No, Sam Condo was a deputy prime Sam minister. Is, Sam is and deputy. Tim was a senior. No, he lost him because he, he left the party and is now supporting Tim. So they lost him. Yes, yes. he fired yeah. Timothy and Sam took a position. Right, exactly. right. So, so you've lost your deputy and, uh, and certainly one of your, your potential leaders. Let's put it no higher than that. Um, and so, so, so therefore, that is a fairly deep fracture within the, the party. And, and it is not likely now that the, the party can hold off a no confidence motion or that the government can hold off a no confidence motion purely on partisan considerations in the House. It is really now about the numbers and where the individuals stand. Um, against the government or for the... the but, but it's not the classic case, that's the case that shows us really that that is how it should be structured. It's about the people, a person, a person presenting themselves to a constituency, constituency mm -hmm. on election mm -hmm. day and say, vote for me. Mm -hmm. And so the people place their confidence in that person. Yeah. 
Okay, you might want to say it is about the political party. At the end of the day, it's their confidence in the individual. And that is what it should be. I think that really what we have done is to, to, to go too much into what the political parties appear to represent. Really, they are a coalition of individuals with a common interest and a, and a common purpose. Hold your, hold your thought, because we have a call. Guess from where? Sinkets. Yes. <laughs> Caller, please. Hello. 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 Yes, go ahead, please, caller. Thanks for calling. Awesome. Okay, we we seem to have a problem with um, with the caller. Um, certainly, the numbers to call once again is one eight eight five two one three seventy five hundred. That's a toll free number. Or call Barbados two four six four six seven ten. Uh, we're taking your call, so please feel free to call. I broke in on your well. Yeah, basically, I was thinking that, you know, the, the, the political parties represent people with a, who've come together, having a common interest, um, and, and, and hopefully a, a shared set of values and objectives. Um, but at a level of policy and governance, very often it is possible, while you're in opposition, to agree with a policy position taken by the government. And there should be nothing wrong with that, because as Sean is saying, if it is in the best interest of the country and the best interest of the people of the country, then why not all, all hands on deck on this matter? There will be times when you, you don't agree, and, and that is a different position, and you take your, you know, you, you draw Let, your Let's go back to what you did, you, you, you and your party did last week. You walked okay. out of the house. Right. There are some people who are saying, um, and in fact, Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez is saying that when parliamentarians do things like that or don't turn up to the House, that a bill is threatening to bring a bill to Parliament, that their salary should be docked. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's a different set of circumstances that give rise to him saying that. No, there's no different set of circumstances. They're the same we, thing. We certainly were there for the whole day. We walked out in the night time. Mm. But feel free to not pay. That is not the issue. The issue is treatment. And, and, and fairness of treatment. And we left the house on the basis of a, an expressed view then and an expressed view afterwards mm -hmm. that if you're going to treat to the um, government side one way, then we expect the same type of treatment to be meted out to the opposition. So you're saying, you're saying then that your party would not stay away from the house? No, no, we went back the following Tuesday. No, but will, will you take that position if something happens, or staying away from, from the house? Well, it depends on what it is. I mean, don't let me just give a car. No, no, I'm you saying, know is that it when, one of the, the When the faced with a situation really... coming on to the last election, mm -hmm. where, as far as we were concerned, Prime Minister Stewart had overstayed his welcome and um, had, had stretched to the outermost limits his constitutional right to be in, 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 in the, Prime Minister, the premiership of Barbados, before calling an election that we felt the time had come to go to the people. And we stayed away from the house, again, on a matter of principle. I, I want to read something that I picked up out of a Canadian um, document on mm -hmm. parliamentary system. It says, the political system does not allow the opposition parliamentarian to do much in governance. They cannot originate bills that involve spending of reason of spending of money. So their role is limited as far as policy is concerned. The places, this places them in a category of members who are underemployed. <laughs> I don't necessarily agree with that. I do agree uh, that Because if you're unemployed, we have to start to think no, about your salary problem. <laughs> matters, as you said, which would require the government to spend money, they would indicate to you that you need the fiat of the governor general. We are a typical example of that in St. Kitts and Nevis, where to date we don't have integrity in public life legislation. Uh, the opposition introduced a private member's bill to have uh, that piece of legislation being debated and hopefully become part of the law in St. Kitts and Nevis. Uh, the Speaker came to Parliament and gave us a very long reason as to why the bill hadn't been placed on the other paper. And he clearly stated that, that, that we don't have the fiat of the Governor General. We're trying to take the calls when they come in. Uh, caller, could you go ahead, please? Sure. Hello? Hello? Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, gentlemen, good evening. 
Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah. Um, some years ago, I called a talk show program. Um, incidentally, I'm calling from St. Lucia. I called a local talk show program. Uh, the, the topic under discussion, under discussion was relating to the stuff that you gentlemen are currently discussing. Um, governance, government, the rule of the opposition, the rule of government, etc., etc. And one of the things that I said was, in order for us to address the problems associated with the topic under discussion, I believe that what we need is a revolution. Now, I went on to say that failure on our part to deal with the issues that we face, and I wasn't just talking about St. Lucia, I made plain that I was speaking about the entire Caribbean. I said failure on our part to deal with the issues we currently face in the region would very well or might very well result in us having to deal with that other type of revolution which nobody wants to talk about. Now, after I said that, one or two callers to that talk show said that I was advocating bloodshed and riot and conflict and all kinds of stuff, although I had gone on to point out, to clarify, that failure on our part to deal with the issues we currently face would result in that other type of revolution. But, you know, later, other callers called the show and said, look, the gentleman is absolutely right. Because revolution, all it means, the fundamental, the, 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 the basic meaning is fundamental change. But, gentlemen, I heard you speaking about democracy and, and, and you know, what it means to us and whether democracy is you know, served in terms of what is happening with the, with the you know, opposition. One of the things I've said too, because you know, I'm, a, I'm a regular comment commentator in, in St. Lucia in terms of, of, of governance, government, and so on, is in certain respects, democracy is a sham because democracy is not well served when the decisions being taken in the name of the people of the various countries in the region, those decisions are being taken by an elite few. There is hardly any consultation, any participation, but you hear invariably governments talking about consulting the people, participation by the people, etc., etc. What is happening in St. Kitts today is a travesty, a real travesty. But you see, when we talk about what used to happen before in terms of scope, you know, the opposition parties in the, in the, in the, in the Eastern Caribbean coming, coming um, together. You know, that doesn't mean a great deal anymore because what is happening today is Carla, that... Could you, could you make a point wrap it up for me, please, though? Sure, mm -hmm. sure. You, 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 you see, look, civil society must play a greater role in what is happening in the region. Unless and until that is done, we're going to continue speaking about this thing ad infinitum. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carla. And that, that's a very important point. Why do you feel that you get the support of civil society? You seemingly in St. Kitts have, from the list you have called out, there seems to be that kind of support. But is civil society respected? Civil society to some extent is respected. Um, certainly we cannot say that the government respects civil society uh, because they haven't adhered to the cause of civil society. I personally would say though that just to write a letter and being ignored after several months isn't enough. And civil society ought to send a stronger message will to you, will the you government. Next point? We have a call now from St. Kitts. Call, please. Good evening. Good evening. It's for Mr. Simmons. Mr. Simmons, if the Constitution has no provision for a timeline for the hearing of a motion of no confidence, does the government have the authority, nevertheless, to take its time and to decide whether or not to accommodate a debate of such a motion? That's a question, or you're telling me that? It seems that he wants to 
He wants to engage you in that on a question, please. So I, I, I hear you, but I don't know that I agree with you because I don't know that there's a constitutional issue attached to the mo um, tabling of a motion of no confidence. But a motion of no confidence is a signal that there is something pretty serious about the of, continuation of the government. Of tremendous importance. And, and effectively, you're saying that the, the parliament is being asked, and this is the, 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 the body of legislators sent by the people. The parliament is being asked to say they have no further confidence in whosoever the motion is t tabled against. Now, at that point, the conventions dictate that everything is placed on pause and a priority is, is, is accorded you to the You say convention, issue. the callers say constitution. That's but, correct. But, but, but this is the point. He is, they, they, they appear to have gone the route of raising constitutional issues where none exist. I think, though, that he may have asked that particular question because the Prime Minister has been saying that the Constitution does not say or indicate a time period in which the motion ought to be debated. But does the Constitution speak to those issues? It no. speaks to mo the motion of no confidence, but most constitutions around the Commonwealth, they do not give a time period. But as Kerry pointed out, as I pointed out, it is convention uh, that this would be a matter which is given priority, urgency over all other government business. The government went to Parliament in April for the budget debate. We took a position back then uh, that, okay, you're speaking about the budget and we consider the budget to be important. And so when we went to court, we had said to the court uh, that we wanted to make a declaration that the motion should be debated as a matter of urgency and before any other business in Parliament, save and except for the budget because we felt that the budget should be given that type of priority. The Prime Minister has given all sorts of reasons in saying kits. In one case, he said, well, there's no budget in place. And because there's no budget in place, there are no monies available to have a general election. Again, that was total rubbish. But we have so been given all, so, all so, sorts so, of excuses. So, so are money some government used to run general elections? In regards to the actual administration of an election, not in terms of the campaigning, well, money is not again. well. <laughs> let's let's <laughs> take a break at this point. A very interesting point on this edition of Time to Face the Facts. This is Time to Face the Facts. We're discussing the role of the opposition. We'll be right back with much more. <laughs> It's time to face the facts on the role of the opposition in the region. Are they fulfilling their obligation to the region? With me is the opposition leader, Mr. Sean Richards of St. Kitts Nevis, and the leader of opposition business in the House here in Barbados, Mr. Kerry Simmons. Gentlemen, uh, somebody mentioned earlier the situation in Trinidad and Tobago. In fact, Mr. Rowley would have been with us, except that they have a by-election tomorrow. And unfortunately, we have to drop. Clear. You know, I'd really love to have had him have him on the set with us. But you were making the point then that it seems that the government were targeting opposition leaders. That's right. I, I was saying that, and I, I feel that there is evidence of that. Um, I, I use Trinidad as, the, as one of the examples. Um, <laughs> I think he has been threatened with several different types of variations of charges. Some of them are almost laughable in nature, but this is the way it is. Um, is this intimidation, you think? You could say that. I mean, look, it is often said that politics is not a Sunday school business. And you know that you're dealing with an effort on behalf of the public to make sure that government and those who are responsible in government are held accountable for what they do. Very often, as the old adage in law says power can corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So there are some people who become intoxicated, for want of a better word, by their power and the ability to wield that power. And, and that would therefore mean that opposition politicians are seen as a nuisance. I mean, you know, you're standing in the way of what we're trying to do, whether or not you feel that what, we're, what the opposition is about is fair comment is not really relevant, it is a humbug. 
and we are often treated as though we are nothing but humbug. Um, but we have a duty to discharge, and that is the constitutional duty that is placed on the opposition, that you have to, you have to discharge a burden and to do it in a very serious and sincere way on behalf of the public. Now, um, leader of the opposition, Rowley, has that difficulty. Sean, obviously, is going through a similar type of thing. Um, here, like I said, we, we get targeted in Barbados every two weeks or so for some other. <laughs> but, but, but it is not, you know, it, it, it should not throw you off. What I'm trying to say is that it is par for the course. You have to expect that. What I don't accept, however, is that you, you, you can continue to do business in this way in the region. Now, let me speak a little bit from the gen as, as part of a generation who is hoping to see change. Right. And the gentleman who called first said fundamental change. I can agree with him. I wouldn't have used the word revolution, but I would, I would agree with fundamental change. And I think that's what he's talking about. And I give you one classic example. I, I served in the Senate and led uh, the, the, the two persons in the Senate of Barbados. Under our constitution, the opposition is allowed the token representation in the Senate, which is a review body um, of two people. We, the opposition has two. The government has 12. Now, clearly, therefore, it stands to reason that virtually everything the government wants, the government is likely to get. Yes, they're independent senators, but they, they are about seven in number. And, and one can determine, debate forever the extent of their independence. But the point is, the opposition has two representatives. Now, I think that that is laughable. It has been a subject of criticism from the time it was created. And it's something that I think should change. And that's why I say some of these things have to be brought yeah. to right. change. Now, the reason it hasn't changed is because when you go into government, you say, well, boy, you know what? We went through that. <laughs> we suffered in that. I, I so let him suffer too. But I, I mean, having, having gone through it, having had to deal with 12 of them, and if your colleague is not present, you deal with all 12 by yourself. I mean, it is, it is really asking a lot. And I, I think realistically that the time has come for us to look at the Constitution of Barbados and to say, look, improve the, the quality of the Senate by in, enhancing the, the power of the opposition. It is a step towards making democracy a more perfect thing. Some people would even say that maybe what we should come to is getting rid of the, the, the Senate altogether because it is a selected chamber. And that's another debate. But one of the things that we have to do is to get serious about the way in which we, we empower those people who are sent to the legislature and expected to discharge a, a duty on behalf of the, the, the country. I have a question coming us, to us via email. It says, are you all aware of the situation with the opposition in Dominica? They actually stayed away from parliament and opened their own parliament under a tent. What are your views and any information on the opposition in Dominica? We actually think it's a Nevis have taken a slightly similar position. We have been boycotting all sittings of parliament. We are of the view that the government is illegitimate, the government is illegal. St. Vincent Boy, you might get paid. <laughs> <laughs> and we will not be part of any e debate under such circumstances. We haven't actually used a tent <laughs> to <laughs> keep our own parliament. But if there are matters of great public importance, then we would utilize the media to speak to our people. Coming back to that, but we have a caller. Caller, please, go ahead. Hi, good evening. Mr. Yes, good evening. Mr. George, I have a question for the uh, opposition party throughout the region. Mm -hmm. When, why, or how is it that when opposition parties are out there articulating all kinds of issues in terms of change, that you know, need to be brought about, especially in terms of laws, etc. How is it that when they get into power, they do not seek to bring about those changes in terms of the laws and your know, thought that they so vociferously spoke about when they were in opposition? Thanks. Thank you very much. 
I think, I think in a sense, you preempted that question um, about two minutes ago. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's a question that you can ask of the government as well, because the government was once the opposition. It is just an unfortunate aspect of how of human the, nature. Uh, I don't, maybe human nature, but it's an unfortunate aspect of the way in which the political system tends to function. Is it acceptable in my view? No. It, it should, is it something that should continue again? No. I share the, the caller's concern. Um, you know, I think that certainly there are a number of things that, that we are seeing in the Caribbean now that if we were given the chance to do, we would want to do in a different way. I have another caller this time from Dominica. Dominica, go ahead, please. Hello. Yes, yes, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you, Anders. I'm following the program, a very speak, interesting program. Speak up a little bit first, please. Yes, good evening. And how are you doing? Very well. Yes, I'm following the program from Dominica. And reference was made to the opposition. I'm a member of the opposition. In fact, I'm the opposition leader in Dominica. My name is Hector John. Uh, and uh, a point was raised about Dominica and the standoff it took re, um, from our old parliament. I think we did that in, um, to sensitize the people or what transpired during the general election of 2009. I think it was very corrupt. Uh, what transpired in terms of uh, disenfranchising the voters. And I think we saw it as um, a step in terms of um, electoral reform, reforming the, the um, election laws in terms of access to the national radio station, voter ID card, cleansing of the electoral list. You know, we saw a lot of bribery importation of voters, and that affects the, the electoral process within the region. And what is sad about it, we are seeing it happen in different islands, and we are not coming together to see how we can solve that problem that is across the board, and what continues to happen with the oppositions within the region. And what transpired with, um, with the, the gains we had with the staying out of parliament, the people begin to realize how important electoral reform is within the region. And I think we are getting the support, even though the government is trying to bring to us um, national ID card, multi-purpose national ID card, but we are moving in the right direction to ensure that we have voter ID cards. And that is critical. And I think the, another point that was raised in terms of some of the committees, the opposition members, uh, we are part of the public accounts committee. And to get access to some of the information from government is a problem. Some of the, yes. the, the committees are very weak. How do we strengthen them by revising the laws within the region? And these are the type of things you have to start looking at. I think early on somebody mentioned revolution, but I think it's a revolution of the mind. Let us start to be more proactive. Let us try to work together in terms of the small island states and how we can force the relationship around the region to ensure that our elected leaders are accountable. We have a serious problem in the region. I am from Dominica, and I can tell you it's a serious problem in Dominica in terms of openness, transparency, accountability, and good governance. Good night and God bless. Thank you for Thank calling. You. Thank you, Hector. I'm the leader of the opposition there in Dominica. Thank you for calling us. We really appreciate that call. The, the, the leader there speaks to a very a key issue. And let me go back to something I, I mentioned earlier, that practically every single one of these islands are in deep economic problems. When you look at the books, real, real problems. There's a lot of red ink there. And often, it seems that the opposition themselves are not even very aware of the situation. What about access to information? Access to information is very important. We have been speaking and saying it's about a Freedom of Information Act. Uh, but like so many other things that the opposition would speak about, the government has refused to, to accept that. I know that. several countries with that, and it means It means nothing. nothing. And I guess you don't have the necessary laws, regulations in place to ensure uh, that you just don't have these pieces of legislation on your books, but actually uh, they work and work um, quite effectively. In St. Kitts, in regards to uh, debt, hmm. persons probably are aware of the fact uh, that we have had to ask for debt forgiveness. We had persons who invested in government bonds who had to take a 50% haircut. I mentioned to you earlier uh, that some 1,200 acres of land was swapped for debt in St. Kitts and Nevis. We are also call. on an IMF program. Go ahead, please. Yes, good evening. 
Good morning. Yes, it's a question to the opposition leader. My question, my question to you is, why is it that uh, the Caribbean leaders do not want to intervene in local politics, but yet, whenever there is election, you'll find them coming in and, and, and helping the incumbent? Very good question. Very good question. Um, <laughs> They, they, they call it basically the same. And it is a fact that during the course of election, there is camaraderie shown by the various countries and, the, I suspect, the parties. Uh, that is perhaps part of the problem. That is part of the problem. Yes, when you have not just elections, but even conventions for the different political parties, you see different prime ministers, different ministers of government speaking on various platforms, be it the government or the opposition. And so I guess when you are sort of aligned with a governing party and uh, that party is not doing what it should be doing in, for example as in think it's a nevis with the motion of no confidence they say absolutely nothing because perhaps you feel you are offending this political party or this prime minister who you're affiliated with well, I, I, I tend to agree with that but i also want to go a step further if 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 we want to speak the language of changing it then we're going to have to realize that part of the responsibility lies on ourselves to be more mature. There's nothing wrong with a Labour Party, and I represent a Labour Party, reaching out in a solidarity way to a colleague party in some other part of the world. Absolutely. And, and, and perhaps even more so in the region, because you may be sharing certain interests in common. But having said that, we also have to recognize and use the African Union as, as, as one of those instances where heads of government and, and state sometimes have to say frankly to their colleague who may be stepping out of line, look, this is not acceptable. Now, that is something that plagued Africa for a long time, but more recently, happily, we're seeing more indications of it that people are prepared to say, look, if you do things the way you're doing it, you're going to make, you're basically making the entire region look bad. Do you think we have politicians in our region who care that much about our region? I think we have some, but maybe not enough. I think that, the, to be honest with you, the Prime Minister in St. Kitts is, is a very senior politician. And maybe the voices that we should be hearing are not just the media, but some of the very, very senior politicians in the region as well saying, look, I mean, you may wish to reflect on what you're doing or the way you're doing it, because clearly, just on the face of things, it doesn't seem as though this is the best possible way of handling the situation. And, and I, I tend to agree with that, quite frankly. I think, I think that the, lead, the senior politicians of our region have to stand up and be counted. I, I really do, do, do agree with that. But having said that, I want to go back into Parliament a bit. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and let's talk about some of the things that are done in Parliament, you think, to stifle it. I know in the region there have been questions, and I have some comments here on the, the speaker, the, the role the speaker plays. People speak sometimes often about the, the way the speaker is selected, and often the speaker is also, it's like a ref, you're playing a game, and one of the people you have to play against is the referee. Let me use that, that analogy. Mm -hmm. How do you feel? Well, I, I, I got in trouble with the speaker last week. You so did? I, <laughs> so I, but having said that, I mean, I, I, I'd be very direct about this thing. And, and hold, I, hold, hold your thought, because we're taking the calls. Oh, okay, okay, fine, fine. A call from Antigua. Go ahead, Antigua. Hi, uh, good evening. Good evening. No, I just have two questions for the panel. Um, my, I'm a young person going up to the Caribbean, and the whole political system itself is not... It doesn't look like it's serving at all. Well, for the young people, I don't know what it's been before. But just two questions for the, for the panel members. Both of the constitutions for both St. Kitts and Barbados speaks to the opposition leader or the opposition basically being persons who do not support the government. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what is it that about the government that both of you are not supporting while you guys are in opposition? And then secondly, um, is, um, I believe, a perceived misconception that the opposition is supposed to be keeping the government in check. But I find that every person who was elected to parliament is supposed to be representing the people from, because you can't have a government that represents part of the countries. 
Have there been any thoughts or what are your perspectives on employment legislation that would allow the citizens or the people to be able to, you know, hold all politicians in check? Or whether it is opposition, prime minister, whoever, you know, such as recalls or petitions, etc. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a break. I'll give you a chance to think about the two questions from the caller. And then we'll be coming right back. We're coming right back to you with much more on this edition of Time to Face the Facts. Don't go away. Welcome back to this edition of Time to Face the Facts. And we, we come right back to a caller on the line from Barbados. Go ahead, caller. Hello, good night. Could you speak up, please? Good night. Good, good night. night. Good night. I am calling to congratulate the opposition party in Barbados. And I want to let them know that they're a, they are doing a good job in keeping the public of Barbados alert. Thank you very much on the economy crisis that is really going on. Only a dumb, a blind, or a deaf living in Barbados who would not be able to see, hear, and know what is really going on in Barbados. And I want to thank them very much for keeping Thank you very alive. much, ma'am. Thank you very kindly. That's a fine club. <laughs> 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 but we have two questions that are maybe not so yeah. simple from the former caller. And the first of them is, um, what do you guys really oppose? <laughs> Well, I think from your particular government. If I follow off of, off of what the last caller was saying, um, it, it, you, you begin by defining what you oppose in the context of, I think, your election campaign. Two parties face the public, offering the public a different pathway of development. In Barbados, the issues were largely on the economic side, and we felt that the route that the government was taking uh, was almost certain to lead us to a course of, of disaster um, in the short term. And in addition to that, you may wish to also look at different emphases for social development and cultural development and so on. The reality is that when once the public has chosen, you can't just go off and say, well, I'm sulking forever. You have to go to the parliament and you have to continue to do the business of the people. To answer the, the previous caller's question then, what we oppose is basically the government's platform for the development of the country. To the extent that the, there is some similarity or cohesion that can be found between our outlook and theirs, then fine, we will work with them. But to the extent that there is a difference of a fundamental nature, then we oppose that. And I think that answers the question. What I would do in regards to saying it's a nervous is to outline a number of the issues which we have raised in the motion of no confidence. We have spoken to the fact that the Prime Minister has bankrupt St. Kitts and Nevis. As a result of that, you have persons who would have invested in bonds who have had to take a 50% haircut. It looks at issues such as electoral reform, which the opposition leader in Dominica spoke about. We have a situation whereby the government in particular moves persons from their strongholds into constituencies that they consider to be marginal. These are persons who have never ever resided in those particular constituencies. It got so bad that after the last local election in Nevis, a matter they had been taken to court which resulted in a by-election and a change of government in Nevis. We have spoken to the fact that the electricity rates were increased by the present government and they are now so high that you have persons without electricity and using candles and lanterns basically in order to get some sort of light during the evening. We have spoken about the land for debt swap and the fact that there was no consultation with the people. We have spoken about the unparliamentary language of the Prime Minister. He has been in Parliament referring to other parliamentarians as hogs, as pigs. And even hold on, hold on, hold on. Where? In Parliament? In Parliament. Where's the Speaker? Uh, the Speaker was in Parliament when the Prime Minister did that. And? 
He said absolutely nothing. He did nothing to stop the Prime Minister. But, but that is unparliamentary language. Yes, but we are not surprised because... I mean you're not surprised. We are not I'm not surprised in regards to the fact that the Speaker has said nothing because this is a usual behavior of the Prime Minister in and out of Parliament. I'm not talking about the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister might try yes. to press. The role of the Speaker is to control the House. And the Speaker would sit there and you would get nothing out of the Speaker. Sometimes you get up on a point of order and you raise objections and your objections are basically ignored <coughs> now so th those are some of the issues which we have raised the fact that we are now on an IMF program and there has been no consultation with the people of St. Kitts and Nevis so these are some of the things which we have uh, formally opposed within a parliament but outside of parliament there are a number of other uh, different factors let, let me come back. I hear you. Let me come back now to the structure of the opposition parties. Because if you look at what happens in the region often, a government come, a party comes to government. It governs two, three terms, perhaps. During that period, the, the party tends not to pay a lot of attention to its own party structure. It finds itself, as you said earlier, in opposition because often the government just simply begin to lose this way right. mm -hmm. and the opposition doesn't really win the government <coughs> loses it. but then when it has lost its way it structures it tatters and and it finds itself having to recoup and then there's the other issue that um, has come around the region about people about um, leaders in different parties not moving aside in a timely matter manner for the parties to move out your views on those call from St. Kitts again we have a lot of attention from St. Kitts go ahead good evening gentlemen Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I would like to suggest that for opposition parties to be taken seriously by the electorate in terms of being considered as the alternative government, these parties must be seen as credible. Mm -hmm. In the case of St. Kitts, the opposition party which Mr. Richards leads has been in the political wilderness since 1995, some 18 years. Two weeks before the general elections of 2010, the former leader of his party was caught on video offering to sell 200 acres of our lands here in St. Kitts in exchange for 1.7 million US dollars to be sent to offshore accounts. This was seen as a corrupt act by five of eight candidates in the party who called for the leader to step down. His party retaliated by firing most of those candidates. Question for Mr. Richards. Has Mr. Richards condemned the action of his former leader who was forced to step down and whom he replaced some two and a half years later and what is his view on corruption in government and also within opposition parties thank you thank you um you may wish to to to, to the first question because i really don't see the point at this point but the second question on the issue of it's up to you now of corruption, whether it's in party, in government, or in opposition? Corruption, whether in government or outside of government, is totally unacceptable. As I said earlier, it is hypocritical for you to be making pronouncements of an, as an opposition, but yet when you are in government, you do the very same thing that you would have spoken out against. It is something that my party does not tolerate. The gentleman who just called and I happen to recognize the voice, he is a former candidate of the party, a failed candidate of the party, as a matter party? of fact, our party, the People's Action Movement. And he has had certain issues, certain gripes with the former Let's leader of the party. Personal. That's why I Lindsay recognize, Kent. and, and I was asking right. to probably bypass that to the question, because I didn't want to drag us into, into that aspect of, of, of the discussion. But I want to get back to the structure of the, the parties they, they have two three term they do not maintain the, the political the party structure they find themselves in opposition 
Um, and the question is, what the other said is that leaders do not move aside expediently enough for the party to continue to grow. I, I, I can, again, I, let me just constrain my comments to Barbados because I can't speak with authority on the rest of the region, on the internal workings of the political parties. Um, in Barbados, I don't know that we really have an issue with respect to the, the structure of the parties. Um, I think that it is correct to say that both parties, whenever they have gone back into opposition, sorry, whenever they've been in government, have maintained a fairly strong structure um, consistently. And when you go into opposition, naturally that tends to strengthen because you have more and more people expressing an interest in the opposition, in the opposition because they, they wish to, they become disaffected with the government that they may previously have elected. Mm -hmm. That is just the natural course of things. Um, with respect to the question of leaders again, I suppose in, in, in the Barbados Labour Party, that may have been raised at one point with the with regard to the previous prime minister Owen Arthur, but um, he certainly is not part of the 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 current leadership. Uh, the, the current leader is is as you know Miss Motley and very much in the prime of youth. So that again, I don't think that that's an issue and that arises. And supported by her entire parliamentary group. <laughs> um, well, I think that beyond all of that, there are other okay, let things. Let me ask a question more directly. But I wanted, no, but I wanted to finish. You can ask me another question. But I there was an issue that you raised that I also wanted to go to. The question of how we, st we function with regard to the, the speaker, for example. Now, again, I feel that it is going to become impossible. It is practically impossible anywhere to legislate fairness yeah. and, and a lack of bias. What the English did was to say to the speaker, look, you are holding a seat that will not be contested. Yeah. And in the hope of that, whether he's a conservative or a liberate or a social democrat or whatever his political orientation is, whatever party he came from, he then knows, well, look, he doesn't have to fight to win a seat. He doesn't have to, uh, you know, he's going to be a member of parliament for an indefinite period of time, pretty much. And in exchange for that, you expect that he will be able to speak impartial. impartially and without fear or the favor. Difference. Their system is an MP who is chosen as leader. Mm -hmm. In most systems in the Caribbean, it's an outsider who's yes. selected yeah. into the position. And oftentimes, a person in support of the government. Yes. How and that, you then that, get, that how is you a, get the same? That's a route that I personally don't support. For the simple reason, the exact reason that you just gave. Because you very often will be selecting a person who is yes empathetic with your party? Empathetic, That's a nice uh, even word. stronger than that. <laughs> yeah, well, no, and in Barbados is an elected member. Mm -hmm. Now we have been fortunate in that we have not had scandalous um, breaches of of what you would expect the parliamentary protocol to be, but we have from time to time had difficulties with what we perceive as the impartiality of the speaker. The question I was going to ask you earlier. Yes, right. It is being rumored that you're the deputy leader of your party. I am the person who was selected as the leader of, uh, of opposition business in the Parliament of Barbados. What does that mean? That I lead such business as the opposition has. <laughs> A real politician. <laughs> but but let's, let's, um, let's, let's go back to, to, to some of the other. Um, what would you guys say? needs to be changed if the opposition is to do its work and if it's to really be taken seriously in the region. And I don't want, I don't want a parochial answer. I, I want an answer that transcends either of your own political experience or position at this point in time. I think we need to do a number of things differently. The opposition needs access to information. And it must be real. It must be meaningful. So whether it is that government has to provide financial resources so that you have research staff or actually put legislation in place whereby information is shared with the opposition, that must be done. It must become critical because it leaves you in a position where you're articulating on behalf of persons and sometimes you are not fully informed as to what currently is the state of affairs. In regards to the Speaker of Parliament, we need to look at 
a different method of selecting our speaker. Perhaps the British model would not be applicable within our region, but maybe there ought to be consensus between the opposition and the government in terms of who becomes the Speaker of Parliament. And but it's never going to be consensus because the government is going to maintain the, the weight in terms of choosing. Yes, but when you begin to look at Parliament and the or basic... Should we take the le when, when there is a general election, should a Speaker be elected during that process? A Speaker? Perhaps, but I, I don't think that that in itself will solve the problem because if you get a speaker who supports one political party or the next being elected you're still in the very same position so uh, that by itself doesn't solve the problem uh, but we need speakers throughout the region who can exercise their authority in parliament without fear or without any sort of favor additionally I think that part of it, though, really comes to the character of the persons in Parliament and the character of persons in government. I believe once you have certain ethical and moral principles by which you stand, it will make the life of the opposition much easier in Parliament. It cannot be that you have absolutely no respect for the opposition. You see the opposition as merely being a nuisance. And so because of that, you fail to give information to the opposition. It is only when you get to parliament, you get information, you get notice about the meeting of parliament a few days before parliament is supposed to meet. You really and truly cannot have meaningful debate on any piece of legislation if two, three days before the debate is supposed to take place, let's you are being given the information. Well, the let's, information. Go, let's go to a different issue, right? And uh, kind of stepping back a little bit to come mm -hmm. forward, where we make, made a point that the Constitution does not speak to parties. The Constitution speaks to uh, the day of election, people present themselves, and one candidate is returned from every constituency. The people have selected you. Do you think? Do you think that, at this point, opposition members should also be given resources since they are elected to carry out the functions of their constituents? I strongly believe that they should be. They said a senior minister who was fired by the government, after the last election, he was named as the minister responsible for constituency empowerment. But such is the budget which was allocated to him, so that you had a portfolio and basically no resources to ensure that you are effective and efficient in carrying out the duties in which you well, have been you assigned. Why do you have to press for that? If, if indeed the system says that the person is elected... Okay, uh, they want me to take a break at this point in time, so let's take a break. Uh, you're listening to, you're viewing this edition of Time to Face the Facts, and we'll be right back in just a moment. Welcome back for remaining moments with opposition leader from St. Kitts and Nevis, Mr. Sean Richards, and leader of government of opposition business in Barbados, Mr. Kerry Simon. You're See, I'm promoting you. You're foreshadowing events. Ah, yes, I'm promoting you. <laughs> <laughs> but we only have a few minutes to wrap this up, gentlemen. Um, actually, uh, a question for you, Mr. Richards, an email question. Can you tell listeners why your party refused to debate two no confidence motion when they were in government in the 1980s? <laughs> I will answer that question, but I think it is rather unfortunate when what was done in the past and what was condemned in the past is being used to justify actions today. Who else don't make a right? Exactly. And while that argument is also being made, let me say that this motion of no confidence was filed by the leader of the opposition, who is Mark Brantley. Mark Brantley is from Nevis. He's a member of the CCM party. In Nevis so that even if one wants to use the argument eh, that Pam didn't hear two motions of no confidence back in the 80s eh, that is a flawed argument two, two wrongs can make a right two wrongs cannot make a right and as far as I know the motions in the 1980s they were placed 
on the other people for a debate. There was an issue with one of them in that the substantive matter which was to be debated as part of the motion was in the court. And that then one can say it was sub judice because you're speaking about the substantive matter, not about the motion itself. And that is what would have transpired in the 1980s. To go back though, to a question that you asked earlier, in St. Kitts and Nevis, we have also been saying that we need term limits for the Prime Minister. No longer should you have a Prime Minister in government for 18 years and then begins to feel as though the country Do you think that is now his. Is a position just for St. Kitts alone? I think it's a position that ought to be adopted by just about all of the Caribbean islands because in so many of the countries we see it and it is only after it would have happened over and over again that we speak about it. It is one of the ways in ensuring that you have adequate control over a prime minister. As Kerry pointed out earlier, I mean when you become so powerful you begin to abuse your power. And uh, that is one way of effectively dealing with that particular situation. My Prime Minister, Dr. Falcons, have coined a position that the opposition should take. Mm -hmm. And it is a very simple formulation that says the role of the opposition is to propose, mm -hmm. to oppose, and ultimately to depose. Your <laughs> well, there's some of that. Some much of that is true. <laughs> much, well, yeah, your position. No, I mean it, 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 that is that is Comrade Ralph. <laughs> you can't fault that. No, I, I I can agree with that. I think it is how it is then, and I don't think the issue in this discussion really has been that the oppositions in the Caribbean have failed to oppose and to propose. In some instances, we may have failed to depose, but that is ultimately a matter of the people, right. a matter for the people. Um, what has come out of this discussion, as I understood it, is that very often governments have not um, seen us as being anything more than an inconvenient aspect of the machinery. And that is the unfortunate part of it. That is the part that leads callers to wonder, well, what will happen when you go into government? Will it be the same thing? And it ought not to be that way. And I think the solution to it not being that way really lies a lot with the public itself and the media. And let us not forget the media really has an important, I keep saying there's an important role to play because they must now speak as the watchdogs of both opposition and government. Do you find, both of you, mm -hmm. do you find that the media in your specific um, territories and by and large you must have observed the region does that? I think in some countries you have a robust media, such as in Trinidad and Tobago, eh, but in the vast majority of Caribbean countries you don't. Yeah, robust media such as Trinidad and Tobago, yes, have I... you just heard the, the last scandal? <laughs> 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 but you take St. Kitts. An attempt is being made right now to change the boundaries in St. Kitts by an illegal and illegitimate government. The chairman of the Boundaries Commission happens to be the chairman of the National Broadcasting Station there is ZIZZABC. Last year in December, I would have sent him a letter asking to do a New Year's and Christmas address live on ZIZ Radio and Television. To date, he hasn't responded to me. Now, the same individual happens to be the chairperson for the Boundaries Commission, and we are saying that this person is biased. I'm going to count you down right now. We must go to a break now. <laughs> 